Welcome, families. It's Crystal Sanford, your host of Thriving Special Families. So glad to have you here today. I'm Crystal Sanford. I am the owner of Sanford Autism Consulting, and I host Thriving Special Families. And I'm here with today, Heather Anderson. Hi, Heather. Hi, Crystal. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so again, families, uh, this show is for you, where we will be sharing on various topics related to the needs of special needs families and children. And today our topic is three tips for teaching and homeschooling your nonverbal child with autism. So Heather is an expert in her own right in that area, and I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much. I, I love to talk about this topic, obviously. So thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, first, I want to note to everyone that the information that is shared here is for your information only. We encourage you to reach out to a professional if you have specific questions regarding your case in the area of medical or legal advice. Um, also note that our, ch our show is sponsored by Sanford Autism Consulting, where you can receive IEP advocacy for your family and advocate for the education that your child deserves. So without further ado, let me properly introduce Heather. Uh, Heather is the creator of the Autism Oasis. Uh, she provides education and support to families affected by nonverbal autism. Her new course, Nonverbal Autism Homeschool, focuses on reading, expressive language skills, and exposing students to age-appropriate academics. What a novel idea. <laughs> um, she's also the mother of a non- a nine-year-old nonverbal son named Tosh, and they live in Southern California. So, Heather, let us know. I'm, I'm a big proponent of the value of story, and I always love to hear a little background, and I'd love to share that with others. So tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to beginning your program and your services to families. All right. Well, um, like so many of the people who do this, it's personal. Uh, my son was born in 2011 and diagnosed with nonverbal severe autism at age three, I think, around the time most are. And we did the, the preschool program at the local elementary school. It was fantastic, fantastic experience. Great. Um, and we went into kindergarten with such high hopes. Um, but the learning kind of stalled in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, first grade, not a lot going on. Second grade, not a lot going on. And so I, like a lot of parents, felt like my son was capable of more. Um, he definitely has some disabilities, some challenges for sure. Um, so much so that I don't even, I think he's intelligent and eat well. I know he's intelligent enough to do mainstream academics, but there's just no way he could sit in a mainstream classroom then or now. Um, right. Maybe in the future, you know, we'll see developmentally what happens. He's come a long ways, but I just didn't want the behavior and the lack of ability to communicate, hold him back from learning. Um, I, I think that the, um, the programs where students stay in the district and in the program until age 22 and learn life skills and get a certificate, that's, that's a fantastic program. And that's what our district had him headed toward. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not for him. I don't, I don't know if he's going to Stanford or, you know, <laughs> something, maybe, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe he'll be an HVAC repair guy. I think that would be a great career, you know, but mm -hmm. anything he's going to do beyond um, janitorial work or assembly mm -hmm. line work is going to require him to know how to read right. and get an education. You know, if ooh, technology is going to make a big deal in the lives of people with disabilities over the yes. next 20, 50 years, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I want him to be ready for when technology catches up to him. So. Pulled him, homeschooled through a charter. Um, he's made really great success. He has stunned his private care providers and his family and everyone around him. And I feel like what I created for him mm -hmm. um, is special and nothing that I'm seeing reproduced anywhere else. And so I partnered with um, one of his former special ed teachers and we mm -hmm. put this program together. 
It's awesome. basically, yeah, it's basically what I've used on my son. Um, and it's a little broader than that because all kids are different. Um, but he's a kinesthetic learner. Um, yes. You know, he likes the hand on hands on stuff um, and and movement. You know, uh, sitting yeah. sitting in a chair isn't necessarily going to happen for very long. So, you know, little things like when he takes quizzes, um, instead of writing it down on a piece of paper necessarily, maybe we make it multiple choice and have three note sticky notes up on the wall. And he okay. grabs the one that's the right answer. You know, things like that. That's that's a big part of what my program is about is is providing opportunities to be flexible. You know? That's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. And, and uh, so unfortunate. Um, and I've seen too many times as serving families as an advocate that there is not that flexibility. It is that cookie cutter approach. I was talking to a parent this morning about that and about how, unfortunately, sometimes there's not precedence for something new and schools are just used to doing, you know, one size fits all. And then that's what they do until you push the envelope, until you try and, and give some other recommendations or until you do what you did and, and create your own program. Well, see, our, our public schools are built on, you know, the, the education model of the late 1800s where yes. we wanted yes. standardized education for everyone, right? And raise the level. And so that's when the standardization you know, began and rightly so for great reasons, but also for efficiency reasons. When you are yes. educating a nation of 330 million or whatever we are, um, right. individual programs just aren't cost effective. Nobody mm -hmm. likes high taxes. Schools are pressured to provide quantified progress. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and IDA. right. Colleges want grades and, and test scores and just education is quantified for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. a lot of very mm -hmm. valid reasons. But when your child has an expressive language disability, an expressive communication mm -hmm. disability, like apraxia, um, that quantification is, is, is very difficult because they struggle to express mastery even though they've learned it. Right, yeah. That's why I like homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Because you get the flexibility of not, you know, you don't have the pressure of providing the work samples and the mastery yes. proof. You can just use the cues that you recognize in your own child mm -hmm. to decide whether they've, whether they understand it or not. And then if you're homeschooling, you can just move forward. There you can go. still do the state standards. You just mm -hmm. don't have that proof, you know, and mm -hmm. then that'll give the child time to develop the expressive language skills. That's wonderful. You know, and I've heard uh, about working with children until they actually obtain that skill until, like you said, they're able to show what they know. And a lot of times, because like you said, you know, we're, we're, we're having to move kind of kids kind of quickly. Um, there's not enough time for that. There's not enough time for them to really master and really grasp concepts and, and be able to show you. And it's not that not, there's not enough time for you to even use different modems to be able to, to teach them so that they can get there right so oh um, well now you're getting on a soapbox of <laughs> omni modality approach yes. oh yeah yeah so valuable for many of our kids i mean kids you know with adhd who can't sit still and kids you know who have uh and i think about our kids who have those more in, in, internal uh behavior issues and, and severe anxiety and those kind of things all these kids with unique needs they learn in different ways and if we can teach to the way that they learn right one of those great phrases then we really can see what they know yeah and if we if we Acknowledge that all of us use multiple modalities to communicate. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we type when it's academic or work related. Um, we use gestures and grunts and slang with our family and friends, sure. right? Yeah. But yet mm -hmm. we expect our kids who are nonverbal to say yes and no with a talking device when mm -hmm. <clears throat> works fine at home. Sure. You, know? So yeah, yeah. It, you know, and so we, yeah, we need to keep the open mind that everybody else texts sometimes writes in proper sentences sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to allow them to develop their own mix of methods of communication. 
Yes. And just a shout out to Emily who's watching. She says, yes, she totally agrees with that, that those multiple modalities are so valid and important. Um, and for parents who are just watching us, welcome again to our episode of Thriving Special Families, where our guest today is Heather Anderson. And our topic is teaching and homeschooling children who have high needs, such as uh, nonverbal autism. And so let's dive into those tips that you have, Heather, as you have been homeschooling your child successfully, I must say, um, and de developed a program around this. What is one of those tips that you have for families who said, hey, my kid has been at home with me and I know now, maybe I didn't know it as much before, but I know now that my kid can learn. My kid who can quote unquote speak can learn and they're understanding, they're comprehending. How can I maximize that? All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you two tips. Okay. So the first tip is something that parents are already doing, which you just mentioned, Great. presuming competence. Mm. The faith, the belief that your child does have normal, maybe above normal intelligence, mm -hmm. and that it's the inability to express what they know that's holding them back. It's not that they don't understand it. It's that they can't express what they understand. And that makes it very difficult to measure their intelligence and what they do right. understand. And so right. presuming competence means that you presume that they're as good as they are on their best day. Mm. And that's their intelligence baseline. And when they regress or you know have a bad day, that that's their body. They're fighting their body. But the brain, you still I still have a pretty normal nine-year-old boy up here. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of everywhere else that he struggles. So right. that's the number one tip. And if you have spent time with your child distance learning and you're like, that's what they learn, you know, that's terrible. What do you mean he can't count to 20? You know, he can, you know, whatever, uh, always know, how, you know, what do you mean he doesn't understand money? He knows exactly what he can and can't spend on eBay, you know, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so the second tip, if you want to get rolling and get started, is um, errorless learning. And this is a concept that was taught to me by um, an ABA therapist. Okay. And um, and it's and if you're scared of ABA, forget I just said that because this is, <laughs> this is highly compassionate and not at all what a lot of people think of with ABA. It's right. Actually, if, when you said ABA, you you might have lost some people right there, uh, you know, yeah. for better or for worse. So, yeah, thank you. We have, <laughs> for well, we have an excellent, trust me, I'm like that parent who would not let any horrible things happen or any sort of abuse or trauma. Sure. So errorless learning is the opposite of trial and error learning, which is what happens in public schools. Mm -hmm. Trial and error learning is when you present the material and then you ask them a question, right? So if it's in a classroom, you present the material and then you say, so-and-so, you know, tell me what I just said, or so, you know, if, if that is true, then tell me what is the answer to this? And then someone in the class would be asked to answer. The teacher doesn't know yet if the children have mastered the material. In fact, they the teacher knows they haven't mastered the material. But in quizzing them, you can discover where the gaps in knowledge are, spend more time on that, and move on. Mm -hmm. That does not work for autistic children and especially nonverbal students for two reasons. First of all, um, there's a lot of anxiety among autistic yes. students, um, sure. and a lot of that anxiety is getting the wrong answer, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're nonverbal and the right answer doesn't always come out of your mouth or out of yeah. your hand, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by asking the student a question and they, they haven't mastered the material yet, it's there's a 50% chance they're going to get it wrong, mm -hmm. and you're going to get an uh, hard pass from your student right. as far as okay. participating or having anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. Now, if they do attempt to answer, this is the second reason it doesn't work. If they do attempt to answer and get it wrong because of the lack of neuroplasticity in their brains mm -hmm. and their tendency to groove really easily, mm -hmm. if they answer the wrong answer, that could be the answer forever. And there's a few things with my son that he still automatically gives the wrong answer, um, even though he, he knows it's the wrong answer, but it's just that, that processing. Mm -hmm. So 
non um, errorless learning is when you present the material and then you give a problem and you tell them the problem and then you tell them the answer. You show them the answer right away. Mm. Then you move on to a second problem. Read the problem, show them the answer right away. And you keep doing this until you see them start to anticipate the correct answer. Um, and most of these students um, get really irritated when you answer for them. So they, they, a lot of them naturally just start, no, that's the answer. I know the answer. And you gradually back off until nice. they're doing it on their own. And this works for everything. I've used this for um, identifying coins um, with um, the, um, oh, I forget what it's, sequence, sequencing, mm -hmm. which is something that my son struggles with, little sequence cards, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing it that way. Right. Um, phonics, absolutely. Math, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and yeah, I use errorless learning for almost everything. And it's, it's a, you have to wrap your head around it because it feels like cheating at first. Mm -hmm. um, you're giving them the answer. You're cheating. No, I'm right. showing my child how to do it instead of just telling them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. I mean, yeah. Right. With my son, he you can tell him all day long. Mm -hmm. He may or not get it. But if you show him how to do something like second, third time, he's got it and you never have to show him again. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that can be uh, a super valuable tool. And thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you know, as we're talking today about uh, homeschooling our kiddos who have high needs, uh, such as nonverbal autism, you're saying that uh, one, we need to have the faith that they can. And I think that can be a huge uh, bridge to climb, you know, uh, mountain to climb uh, in and of itself is believing that our kids can uh, and they are you know, gifted with abilities, like you said, maybe that they're not as obvious for as it is with other kids. But um, once we can get over that and know that they can, then you're saying this errorless learning is, is one a tool that you can use to help them get from you know not doing to being able to to do a school and 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 even you're building in that internal motivation to want to do it, and that's something that's all often tricky for our kids, getting them that want to. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I'm able to talk my son into doing schoolwork by telling him, you're not going to get it wrong. Mm, you're, you're not going to get it wrong. It's not going to be hard. I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun. You know, I mean, and sometimes even we're doing um, multiplying two digit and three digit numbers right now, um, which is very difficult. Wow. He doesn't enjoy it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But he is, he is learning. He actually loves multiplication. Um, he, this is his, um, oh, he awesome. loves the array and the, mm -hmm. the pattern of multiplication charts. And so yes. this is how, one of the ways that he, he does it rather than being able, having to write down the answer, he can kind of point to it on that chart. Oh. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. My my, my daughter, uh, also on the spectrum, and, and she's just turned 10. Um, she also loves numbers, loves anything that is consistent, right? And it's easy and you can memorize it and it doesn't change. Um, yeah. So she loves multiplication. And her teacher always says, she's the first one to give me those math facts. I don't know what you guys have done. I'm like, we didn't do anything. It's just a, a natural interest of hers, um, yeah. you know, when it comes to those numbers. So that's awesome that you found a way for your son um, to be able to access that information as well and show you what he knows about multiplication. Yeah, I can, there's, there's always yeah. another way around, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. I can imagine that. No, I'm just going to say, I can imagine that there are parents out there who have, is he third grade? He's a fourth grader. He's fourth yeah, grader. And I bet there are parents who have fourth graders who are nonverbal with autism, and they would never believe that their child would be able to do that. And you're showing that it, it can be done given, you know, certain contexts and supports. It can be done. It, it can be done. We work at a much slower pace than his neurotypical peers. If this okay. is the mainstream textbook that he's using, he's doing mainstream work, but um, they do a chapter like every day or like a lesson. They do a lesson a day right. or a lesson every two days. We do a lesson a week. Okay. It just, it takes longer. We also use the reteach version, which is like mm -hmm. simplified mm -hmm. version. Um, I make the page as simple as possible. Right. Um, yeah. you know, there's a, there are a lot of accommodations that we're making, mm -hmm. um, 
but he's he's progressing you know one one tip to to develop that presumed competence and maintain it through the rough times is what i've done is i have sought out nonverbal adults on social media mm. there's a number of them who have blogs they're yep. on facebook they're on instagram mm -hmm. and um they answer questions and they 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 communicate what it's like to be nonverbal um and they provide kind of the ones that can communicate mm -hmm. are the ones who homeschooled. I hate to say it, but <laughs> most of them homeschooled mm -hmm. and were able to get a diploma and, you know, take some community college courses or mm -hmm. some of them have even gone to four year universities. Um, they work at like Trader Joe's stocking shelves, just like every mm -hmm. other college student, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. really great. So it's, it's important to, see that to mm -hmm. have some sort of vision of what your child could achieve yes um because we know they're not going to be ceo probably you know or they're not right. there's, there are some limitations mm -hmm. um but there are absolutely alternatives to what essentially is in-home institutionalization where they sit at home yeah. all day watch tv go out occasionally, can't communicate very well. Um, that's not going to happen to my son. Like I, I just, I know right. he's capable of more. And if it takes out of the box thinking, and if it takes me doing it myself, I'll do it. And hopefully we will inspire reform along the way. Cause just the, that, that efficient school model and the individual needs of our children, our children are expensive to educate. They just are. Um, sure. it's just, it just doesn't go together yet. We need yes. To. Well, you know, kudos to you for developing something outside the box, something that can, uh, be a great tool and a resource for families. So again, if you're just watching us, I'm Crystal Sanford, your host of Thriving Special Families. We have Heather Anderson here, and we're discussing how to homeschool your child with nonverbal autism. We've gone over two tips so far, and I want to dive into maybe another tip that you have for families who are struggling at home now with uh, distance learning or, or hybrid education. What can they do in educating their child, uh, Heather? You know, one area where there is a great need is um, AAC support. And that is more than just a talker. A talker is an important part of it, but that's not that's not the end of it. We were talking a little bit earlier about mm -hmm. the, the omni modality approach. Yes, and teaching AAC as more than just the talker, mm -hmm. um, improving vocalizations and typing and texting, mm -hmm. and you know using um, you know pointing if need be, mm -hmm. um, just really developing letterboard. Is mm -hmm. something you know that's really um, quite popular and effective. Mm -hmm. um, just being more flexible in mixing the different methods of expressive communication. Um, my son is great on proloquo. Um, he struggles with handwriting, and yet. Many days, if asked if he wants to answer a question on Proloquo or write it, he will pick writing. I don't know wow. why. You know, it seems like such right. a big struggle for him, but that's, and I don't know if it's that he wants to be more like the neurotypical kids or if, hmm. you know, it's easier for him than it appears and AAC might be more difficult than it appears. I don't know. But um, being flexible with that, mm -hmm. exploring different paths, letting them kind of choose how they want to answer. Um, that's important. And when it comes to that AAC, I really feel like parents need to have control over the device and the software mm -hmm. um, so that you can use it at home. I've seen too many kids cut off from their device over summer breaks yep. or because of COVID yep. um, or they have to leave it at school and they can't mm -hmm. communicate at home. I mean, you know, that's the equivalent of having um, a deaf student who only speaks sign language at school. And the family never learns. Like right. you know, families with with deaf family members, everybody learns sign language, so they yeah, can exactly. communicate. Exactly. Parents need to learn how to use AAC. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and have it at home and be able to work with the kids at home. So I um, include AAC in my course very heavily um, to teach the first core 40 words, yes. as well oh, as yeah. the categorization, where to find toys, where to find animals, where to find mm-hmm. food, where to find art supplies, you know, all that, so that they can combine those core words with the categorization mm-hmm. and have be able to have some functional communication. Now that's awesome. You're talking my language now, right? Because uh, although yes. I do serve as an IEP advocate, I've been a speech pathologist for over 20 years. And so when you say that core 40, like very valuable, very important in allowing, it really opens doors and allows kids to do more than just yes, no, um, you know, or just, you know, the real, the basics when you, yeah, when you get to that. that. Yes, yeah. exactly. How about well, them and, asking and, a question? Yeah. Well, and imagine Crystal, how much better your students would have progressed If, you know, at home they had resources to, you know, practice the core word of the week or whatever Mm -hmm. that you were working on. And so you would introduce it and then, you know, they would come home and have an activity where they would practice it. And and mom would learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, siblings perhaps um, to the point where I've I've become so good at it that my son and I have conversations just on proloquo. And he prefers we speak that way when we're having an emotional conversation. Interesting. Right? About like maybe he is being punished or maybe mom had a meltdown, you know? I mean, it's been a long year for everyone. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the combination of the, the heavy conversation plus my voice, mm-hmm. um, ah. he's nine and he's, yeah. you know, he's all irritated by his parents all the time now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's too much. But if we're on kind of a level playing field of the device, it's a little removed for me and it's it works so much better. So I, I think great. it's really important that families learn to use it as well. That's great. That's great. And if parents, if you have questions and you're watching us live, please feel free to add that to the comment section. Also, let us know where you're watching from. Um, Heather, that's that's amazing. And, and you're right. Uh, and I'm telling parents this now while we're in distance learning. Ask your IEP teams for training on the device. Ask them to, your, your speech pathologist likely to go over that with you and maybe do some uh, one-on-one Zoom calls, you know, ask for that training and uh, get that knowledge so that you can start implementing it at home because consistency is where our kids learn. You know, they they don't naturally generalize well, but if we can't all speak the same language using the same tools, we're, we're bound to see more progress in our kiddos. Yeah. You know, if you're a Prolo Quo user or your child's been trying to learn another system, but the, you don't have the access. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a course on it. Like that's a big part of my course. But also, Great. honestly, you can learn a lot from Assistive Wear's um, YouTube channel. Okay. Um, another reason that I recommend Proloquo is because Assistive, Assistive Wear, um, which is the software company, their mm-hmm. customer service is phenomenal. Like if you, awesome. if your child accidentally delete well accidentally or deletes it off the ipad Mm -hmm. um and you need help reinstalling it they're back to you within like an hour of messaging them on facebook or yeah they're really great great. that's pretty great wow and and (laughs) proloquo to go is one of the popular ones i know that the the lamp program is another one uh touch chat so some of these yeah uh uh-huh so uh parents you may have uh access to one of these options. And if your child is using that, I, I really do encourage you to, to get some training uh, so that you can help bridge that gap because it could be uh, the way to open the door to communication for your child. It really could be. Oh, um, absolutely. You know, I, I, I read a story on Facebook just the other day about a 12 year old who had never communicated expressively. Um, he'd been, they had him on pecs the whole time. Okay. Yeah. No progress. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> My goodness, excuse me. Um, he got a brand new speech therapist who said, why doesn't he have a device? Oh, he right. just, he's not ready. He can't handle it. She ordered one that day. Within a week of using it, mm-hmm. um, he learned how to say F you, leave me alone. <laughs> and right. was suddenly communicating <laughs> yeah. very well. So yes. it's, it's in there. I mean, and this is a child who, Nobody presumed his competence, and he mm-hmm. clearly had competence and a right. lot of age 
frankly, yeah. because yeah. of it, you know? So it's just, it's so important. It's, it's mm. yeah. We have to be their, their number one cheerleader. Yes. Yes, that presumed competence, like you said, um, you know, giving them the multiple modalities, accessing with AAC, all great tips for families who are homeschooling, uh, either homeschooling tra in a tra as a traditional term or if they're supporting their child via distance learning right now. Um, so, Heather, in our last few minutes here, let us know about uh, this program that you have and how parents can access this. All right. So. The program is called Nonverbal Autism Homeschool. It is a complete program. So you, if you're homeschooling, you could use just this. Mm -hmm. um, it's 18 weeks. Each week you get a bundle of curriculum that's filled with instructional videos. You have access to me as well as a special ed teacher for live Zoom Q&As. Um, as we said, it, I focus on reading, expressive language, and exposure to grade appropriate academics. What I mean by that is science, social studies, um, art, at grade level without requiring expressive language to prove mastery. Um, so yeah, or just doing, you know, um, kits or experiments or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, the program, I, I provide a um, weekly schedule. So, you know, do this worksheet and this activity and play this game and watch this video. All right, Monday's done, you know, Tuesday, hey, here's, book. here's this, you know, here's this AAC instruction, do this. And mm -hmm. so you don't have to think. I think that's the, the scariest thing about homeschooling is mm -hmm. where would I begin? What would I teach them? How would right. I do it? I try to, you know, to to provide the answers to all those things. And so all you have to do is actually do it. Wow. Taking the guesswork out of it. That can help to, it to not feel so overwhelming. Yeah, I compare it, I compare it to like a, a subscription meal kit, you know, mm. you know planning, you know, meals. If, if someone would just send me a box with all the ingredients in it and I just throw them together and make a meal, I could yeah. do that, right? Well, that's kind yeah. of what this is. This is a homeschool subscription kit where you just download it all off the you know cloud every week and um and there's a ton of instructional videos especially for the pro loco stuff and yeah it's a very complete program perfect perfect well families i definitely encourage you to to check this out you'll see in the comments uh the uh, link and information about heather's program um also information about my services as an iep advocate if you are uh still in the public school system with your child with high needs and you need someone to look over your iep or support you feel free to uh uh, contact me so that I can be that support to you advocating for the education that your child deserves. Um, Heather, tell us uh, one quick funny story about parenting taught Tosh during this time that we've been in. I love to end on a positive note. I know you've got some stories because don't we all? <laughs> you know, one thing I've been wondering about is if some of our kids didn't get COVID and, and, and we just don't know about it because it seems like his taste and smell aren't as sensitive as they used to be. Whoa. He is eating all sorts of things now. Mushroom ravioli, fish sticks, you know, Whoa, um, cranberry cool. sauce, like really intense smells and tastes. And he's just like everybody else. He's um, pizza, hamburger, goldfish, cracker, and mm -hmm. apple. You know, mm -hmm. um, and, and he will do smoothies and stuff, and he eats plenty of healthy foods. But he had a very limited diet, and suddenly right. it's exploded. And I'm seeing this with other kids. Wow! Um, so I, I can't help mm. but wonder if uh, other parents, you know, are experiencing yeah. the same. And yeah, those birds this year. So. Wow. Well, I mean, I think it's it's a good thing if, if if that is the case. At least this is positive. Opens up your opportunities to you know give them some different foods and um, oh, yeah, that it's, part's pretty good. It makes my life a lot easier when we can eat the same meal. Yeah. You know? I don't no idea. Hamburgers every night, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, Heather, it has just been a pleasure. I'm so happy to have you here with us today, yeah. and uh, uh, thank you for being a resource to families like your own, like mine, all impacted by autism, um, but in different ways. And sounds like your program would be an excellent resource. Yeah, if if parents, in fact, 
Um, every single parent who is enrolled in my program has had a phone conversation with me first or a Zoom conversation to talk about their student and their family and their lifestyle, how much time they have, mm-hmm. you know, what the concerns are, what the needs are to make sure it's a good fit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't expect anyone to buy something, you know, blindly off a website, um, sure. you know, reach out. I'm more than happy to have a call. Awesome. And that's at uh, theautismoasis.com. Correct. Perfect. All right, families. Well, thank you again for joining us for another episode of Thriving Special Families. I'm your host, Crystal Sanford, your autism and IEP advocate, and I encourage you to have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thanks again.